turn to Isaiah chapter 12. Our, our pastor mentioned this morning that um, in, in uh, that the gospel message is a, is a message that's it's repeated off over and throughout the scripture there's similar themes over and over and over again in different contexts and different ways all of those meant to edify you and your particular need whatever relates to you or however you know whatever you know but but the underlying message the theme is so often is so often the same and uh, that's okay, because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So there's a, there is a commonness to the, to the gospel theme. And um, I was looking at, there's a very short chapter in Isaiah. Most of the chapters are long, but there's a short chapter in Isaiah. I'm going to read that, and then I'm going to go back to the previous chapter, because he's referring to the previous chapter on a point. It says, uh, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 12, And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I'll praise thee, though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day you shall say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. <clears throat> and the first question that, that, that kind of comes up is, in that day, what day is he talking about? What day is he talking about? And if you go to the previous chapter, it, there's the, the context of that day. And then we'll kind of go back to it. In, in verse chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, he he's, he's, here's the day he's talking about. He says, and, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. I want to jump down from uh, verse 4. He goes on to describe some other things. But to jump down to uh, verse 10. He says, and in that day, speaking, you know, that in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand as an ensign for the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. I like that. His rest shall be glorious. And then uh, finally in, uh, in verse 16, and, and there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the days that he came up out of the land of Egypt. So I want to go back to these these three sections here and he's talking about this day where there's going to come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse now first of all <clears throat> it's interesting that he doesn't say out of David he talks about David's father Jesse now that's intentional because um, he's saying that um, there's no great thing to be desired about him the lineage that he's going to Jesse Jesse's father was basically a peasant farmer he wasn't a noble king or a great thing and uh, as uh, uh, but he's talking about he's going to come from a, a mean background an average normal background there's going to be and I, I as I, I looked at that I thought of um, Isaiah 53 2 you don't need to turn there but it says he'll grow up as a tender plant as a root out of dry ground he has no form nor comeliness and when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him, speaking of the coming Christ. And so it's the same thing here. It says, there will come forth this rod out of the stem of Jesse, this plain background, nothing that we should desire him. 
the branch will grow out of his roots, <clears throat> and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now, this is speaking in prophecy of the Christ to come, <clears throat> obviously. Um, it says that uh, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, etc. If you want to turn uh, to Isaiah 9, as long as we're in the book of Isaiah, just go back a chapter. Speaking of this Christ to come in verse 6, For unto us a child is born, a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So this one that's coming, so when it, when, it, when uh, we see in chapter 12, he says, in that day, it's, the in that day he's talking about is when this Christ is revealed, when this Christ is revealed, both in time, whether that's in A.D. 0 or A.D. 33, or when it's in today in your world, today, today in your life, when, when Christ is revealed. Um, <clears throat> The second part down there, it says uh, in verse 3, he'll make him a quick understanding. He'll not judge after the sight of his eyes or the hearing of his ears. That kind of caught me a little bit funny in the sense that um, I thought a good judge would, would listen and, and see and hear, but he doesn't need to because he's judging based on uh, God's standard and he's judging based on righteousness. He can't be deceived or, or uh, uh, fooled in any way. Whatever you present to him or whatever you say to them, he knows the truth of whatever it is. It doesn't need to be instructed. Uh, he judges perfect judgment. And then uh, in verse 10, this is really, to me, kind of interesting in its own way. It goes back to that idea that in that day, uh, this is, it says, in that day, in verse 10, there's a different play on words here. It says, in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. Now he's talking about that Christ, and that Christ is going to be dying. You know, in that day when he, he lays down his life, that ensign, uh, first of all, let me go back to in, in that day where he says there'll be a root out of Jesse. If you look in verse 1, he says that this Christ to come is going to come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Now he's saying that that this thing, this person that's coming is going to be the root of Jesse, or Jesse's going to come forth from him, or he's going to be the, uh, the who, he's who bears up Jesse. So in one case, he's the branch, if you will, coming out of Jesse. The other case, he's the root from which Jesse springs. And I thought to myself, in, uh, when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, he asked them the question, how is it that this Messiah, he, he's David's son, yet David's Lord? He said, so he's saying the same thing here. He says, this is David's son in verse 1, and he's saying he's David's Lord in verse 10. He says, this, this is, uh, he's, he's, he's Jesse's son in one case, and he's Jesse's Lord in the other case, which is the same thing Jesus was saying, and, and which was a mystery that the Pharisees could not, I have no idea how this works. It only works if God himself um, would become incarnate as a man out of that lineage and, uh, and go to become an ensign for the people. That ensign, it was mentioned this morning, uh, it comes from... Um, uh, Numbers 21, if you want to turn there, just briefly. Um, the story was mentioned this morning. I'll just add a few things on to it here. The people were uh, in the wilderness wanderings, beginning in verse 5. And it says, The people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore, you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness, for there is no bread, neither is any water. Our soul loatheth, loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, and we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Boy, there's a lot of lessons in there about when adversity comes your way, you know, they, 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 they take a good action. And, uh, um, and Moses, not to, not berating them, they said, would you pray for us? He didn't say, well, this will teach you a lesson, blah, blah, blah. There's no, uh, there's no payback, no. But Moses says, and Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. Now, this is a picture of Christ being crucified. 
Uh, it's also, if you like, if you go by your pharmacy, you'll see it on your pharmacy sign, right? There's a pole. You look at any pharmacy, and uh, there'll be a, a green sign there, and you'll see a snake wrapped a little, around a little pole. That's the, the sign of a pharmacist. That's a, the logo of any pharmacist. And uh, so it takes this, uh, makes a, a fiery servant, sets it upon a pole, and it should become to pass that, that everyone is bitten, that, that everyone that is bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, put it on the pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. And, and so forth. So where it says here, in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, uh, you know, David's, David's Lord, if you will, Jesse's Lord, which shall stand as an ensign for the people. Now this is, you know, this is written a thousand years before the Christ had come. He said there's a day coming where, th there, where this, uh, this one is going to arrive. This Christ is going to arrive. And uh, the spirit of wisdom and understanding is going to be on counsel and might. And he's going to become an ensign. He's going to put himself on that tree on the behalf of his people. And all those that look to him, when they look upon him, they're going to live, just as those in the Old Testament. And it says, to, and to add to that, to it shall the Gentiles seek. And there's hope for you and I, unless you're Jewish. <laughs> I mean, uh, that, that's a huge thing. And to the Jewish mind reading this, this had to cause them a lot of trouble. Right, because all of a sudden it says, and to it the Gentiles will seek. Well, the Gentiles are despicable dogs. They're filthy, they're dirty, they're immoral, they're corrupt, they're everything. Why in the world would that happen? And yet, in you know, a thousand years before Christ to come, he said, this is the way it's going to be. This is the way it's going to be. And his rest, I, like, I really like, this is the verse that really caught me on this, this whole section. And his rest shall be glorious. It'll be glorious. And uh, you think about... Uh, Jesus saying, come unto me, all ye that, are, that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. What, what are you resting? You're only resting if you're tired of doing what you're doing. If you're trying to going the way you're going. You only seek rest if you're tired of your way. And God give you to be tired of, of your way and tired of trying uh, to please man and tired of trying to please God by what you do. And look upon Christ, that one that's hung up on that tree as an ensign for all the people. And, uh, and uh, look unto him for rest if you're heavy laden and tired of trying your way and try, tired of trying a way that makes the world happy. Like Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I'm meek and lowly in heart and you'll find rest unto your souls. Uh, so going to then uh, Isaiah 12. I think I hope we've established that that day that he's talking about is this day that Christ arrives, and you can look at this at two levels. You can look at this literally when Christ arrived on the scene uh, as a child in the New Testament, when the old man that was waiting in the temple saw him and said, "Now I can die. I've seen the Lord's Christ as was promised to me." Or you can see it in Mary Magdalene weeping at his feet, or you can see it in blind Bartimaeus, you know, "Jesus, thou Son of David, have mercy." Those the excitement. The, the, the joy that when Christ came, or you can see it in the joy that when Christ visits every one of his believers in that, in that day when he's going to reveal himself to them. It says, in that day, that day when Christ visits you, or in, in, the day, in, in the day when he visited the earth, but in that day when he visits you, you'll say, you were angry with me, but your anger's turned away. Your anger's turned away and you've comforted me. So I asked three questions. I think it's three. One was, uh, first of all, to establish, turn to Ephesians. Um, I've got the I've got the uh, part part of the verse on your uh, hand out there, and you know from Ephesians two and verse three it says, "Christ, um, uh, he, among whom we also all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature as." As you can see in the verse there, the last part of it, and we're by nature that by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So God was. It, it says, "Though thou wast angry with me," I'm just establishing this point that the Scripture lays out that you know all men are in the same boat. Uh, they're not uh, that man outside of Christ is is uh, has the wrath of God abiding upon him. Now it just so happens it pleases God. Uh, to pull his people out of that by the message of the gospel. But uh, the scripture says that up until that point, 
They, they're, uh, they, you know what the sword of Damocles is? It's that sword that hangs up in the sky and just waiting to chop your head off. It's uh, it, the sword hangs over every man's head. It's God's judgment, just waiting. It says they're children of we're we're all children of wrath, even as others. But that sword is over our head. Should we die uh, outside of Christ, we're going to go to a, 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 a an eternal hell. And uh, so, how is it this wrath is turned away? Turn to Romans fifteen. Because in that day that Christ visits a man, or a woman, they're going to say, I'll praise thee, you were angry with me, but that anger's turned away. <coughs> in Romans 15, in verse 3, it says, For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. And the reason the anger is turned away is that all the reproach that belonged on him, the on the believer, all the reproach that belonged on the saint was diverted and fell on Christ Jesus. It fell on him. He took it on himself. Willingly took it on himself. We read this morning in Isaiah 53, we saw about how the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And you can always go back to Isaiah 53. It's a good one to always read. Um, he said, my righteous servant will justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. That's the thing. Your wrath was on me, but by the grace of God, uh, before eternity, it pleased you, God Almighty, to send this one uh, to be an ensign for the people, to put himself up on that tree and to take the reproach that would do me. It was due, and it was due you. And like John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Behold, behold. Same thing Moses said. Behold that, behold that brass serpent. You want to live? Look. Um, <clears throat> it goes on to say there, it says, You were angry, angry with me, your anger's turned away, and now you comfort me. And now you comfort me. And uh, turn to Isaiah 40. You can only be comforted, you know, prior to being comforted, I assume you were uncomfortable. You were uncomfortable. You were not content that you were, your relationship with, with God was good. Not content, not certain, not sure, living in a world of doubt. But when you're, in that day when Christ visits you, there's going to be comfort. There's going to be comfort and assurance and in Isaiah 40, in verse 1, in verse 1 to 2, it says, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she is received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Again, where is this comfort? The comfort is in that that warfare was taken on for you, on your behalf. It's like someone coming to you say, yeah, the enemy was coming to chop your head off, but guess what? I rode outside of town, and I engaged the battle, and I took care of it for you. It's over. It's over, and you have nothing more to fear. It's an awesome, awesome thought. Was his wrath turned away for all? We know from Matthew 121, where uh, the angel said about Jesus uh, uh, to Mary, he said, you'll bring forth a son, and he call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And we know that from so many different verses. I, ha I thought of a question. If God did desire to save everyone, why didn't he do it? If it's obvious he didn't do it, and the only answer you can come up with is that either um, if he wanted to, he can't get the job done. The, either the blood is inadequate, he didn't do enough himself to make it happen, or he is submitting himself uh, to a countervailing power that he can't control or change. God, there's another power in the universe that he cannot change what they want to do. And that would go straight against Scripture where he says, I'll do all my pleasure. How do you square that? How can God do all his pleasure if you could stop it? If you could stop it? It makes no sense. It makes no sense at all. 
But uh, his wrath isn't turned away for all. It's turned away for his people, those he died for. Even in the uh, even in the Old Testament, there in that example, the ones who were healed were the ones who were bitten. As as Pastor pointed out this morning, if you're bitten, you recognize you recognize the certain death condition that you're in. Just as those bitten by fiery serpents, they knew that I've only got so much time. I'm, I'm a goner. There's, there's, I'm not going to make it out of this. Those are the ones that look to Christ. And so it is when the scripture convinces you that you're a goner. You are a goner. May it be that you would look to Christ. And then verse uh, verse 2, he goes on and says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Uh, literally, that first section there, Behold, God is my salvation, would read, My salvation is of God himself. And, uh, you know, we talk about how the Old Testament and the New Testament are in, in, in this perfect harmony. And we see that, you know, God, again, I'm making this assertion that man doesn't add anything. He doesn't add anything that my salvation is of God himself. That's my boast. That's my brag that God saves his people. And uh, what amazing grace it is that he might save a wretch such as I. Uh, in Psalm 68, turn to Psalm 68. I don't think I have it on your thing there. Um, in Psalm 68, verse 20, describing God, it says, <clears throat> He that is our God is the God of salvation. And unto God, the Lord, belong the issues of death. And belong the issues of death. That uh, you know, our God is is is, a, is, a, is the God of salvation. He says, um, He shall save His people from their sins. Because salvation is of the Lord, saith the Scripture, over and over again. Um, <clears throat> turn to um, Hebrews chapter seven. And I want to pick up on the thought <laughs> that um, where he says, uh, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. I'll trust and not be afraid. If you read in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, it says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, that's by Christ, seeing he, that's Christ, ever liveth to make intercession for them. No wonder the person says, I'll trust and not be afraid. I'm not afraid because I'm not trusting on what I did. If I'm trusting on what I did or a choice I made or something I did, I'm not so sure today I feel very good about that choice anymore. I go up and down with moods of emotions. Uh, every other kind of thing. If, I, if my confidence and my hope is in his work and his work alone, I can rest assured. I can have that confidence. I can say, yeah, I know that his work pleased the Father. I know that my work will never please the Father because it's never perfect. It's never righteous. It's, his work is completely whole, righteous and whole. That placed upon me puts me in a position of safety because he ever liveth that makes intercession for believers. Um, so they can trust and not be afraid. We know in that same Hebrews, you don't need to turn there. He says, you know, the natural condition of man is to, to fear. If nothing else, to be afraid of death. I know a lot of times young people think, well, I wouldn't be afraid of death. Well, hang around long enough. You'll see. Because um, he delivers those who through fear of death all their lifetime were subject to bondage. And he's talking about all people, all that he saved. Every man that walks the face of the earth is under bondage through fear of death says the scripture. So, <clears throat> um, back to Isaiah 12 here, at least for me, where he says, by the way, where he says, um, God is my salvation, I'll trust, I won't be afraid, for he's my strength and my song has become my salvation. Um,
where it says he's he's my strength he's my strength he doesn't look for anything from himself I, nothing did i add to this he's my strength and uh, i've got a quote here from calvin on that he says by, and i like this quote he says by faith we perceive that salvation is laid up for us in god and a calm and peaceful state of mind arises from it that's what he's talking about here but when faith is wanting there can be no peace of conscience let us therefore know that we have made good progress in faith when we have been endued with such confidence as described in Isaiah 12. It follows that there are none who sincerely and heartily sing the praises of God, but those who, convinced of their weakness, seek to obtain strength from God alone in answer to prayer. Nor is he here called a part, nor is he here called a part or an aid of our strength, but our complete strength. For we are strong so far as he supplies us with strength. And that's so true. So it's, it's a complete and a total confidence in Christ's strength. He, he, he is what uh, uh, gets us out of the situation that we're in. And then uh, in verse 3, Therefore we'll draw, you, you shall jo with joy draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day you shall say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people. I was thinking about that woman at the well. Jesus said to her, uh, how would you like to drink something that you'll never need to drink again? You'll never need another drink. And she's like, well, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? He's talking about the gospel of her salvation. Draw waters out of the well of salvation. Uh, you drink of this, you'll never need to drink again. And, and the, 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 all your soul's need are met in Christ's sacrifice on that cross. Foretold here thousands of years before Christ came that uh, that that uh, his, his people in that day, in the day that Christ visits them, are going to drink from that, that well from, from which they'll never need to drink again. And that's the, the righteousness of, of Christ. Um, it, go, it goes on to say, uh, in that day you'll praise the Lord, call upon his name, and you can think in the New Testament when uh, Jesus said, these things I've spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. And we see that same thing in, in that day. In that day when Christ visits his people, there's going to be that joy. It's going to be that joy. Um, and that joy, the other th way you can look at that verse 3 there, drawing, draw water out of the wells of salvation, is, is that uh, they're going to find their hope and confidence in the word of God. The well of salvation being the word of God. And I say that because uh, you know, when Jesus says, these things I've spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you, he's saying, my words, this is what I'm saying. I'm saying these things to you. The word of God's coming to you. My joy might remain in you and your joy might be full. He's saying that the joy of the believer is in the word of God. It's in the word of God. And they're going to draw, they're going to draw that word out, draw water out of the wells of salvation. They're going to find their hope in the word of God. Um, and then it goes on to say that, that uh, they'll call upon his name and declare his doings among the people. And in 1 Peter 3.15, it says, Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you of the reason of the hope. And, they, and uh, every man that asks you with meekness and fear, say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what's going on. Let me tell you about this incident that I saw. <laughs> First, I was bit by the serpent, and then I found this hope. So in verse 5, sing unto the Lord. He's done excellent things. That's what you're going to say when Christ visits you. He's done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out, shout, for great is the Holy One that's in the midst of you. So in conclusion on all this, you know, what is the day that he's talking about here? He's talking about the day of Christ's visitation. And you can see that in the New Testament to all those that saw him, all those that were waiting for him. And it happens every day in everyone that comes to believe this gospel. When, he, when God himself addresses you about your situation, and, and uh, that's your day of salvation. That's when things are going to change, as they did here. You'll see that your salvation is of God. You'll see that uh, you, as he visits you, you'll, you'll be unburdened. All that caused you discomfort and fear and brought about the wrath of God upon you is washed away in trust and faith towards God. So your boast will now be in his work and his work alone. It's his work that will bring you comfort. And speaking of this will be a great honor to all those around about. So 
that's the joy uh, of 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 the of the work of Christ. One turn to Isaiah fifty nine. Last passage, and I'll make a brief comment about it. You know, some people, you know, they, they can grow weary in the weight. They can lose sight of things, and sometimes they're losing sight of Christ or growing weary in the weight, there, there's a warning to those who, who, who don't continue to, to call out. And in verse 59, chapter 59, verse 1, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. That's great news. His ear hears. His ear hears the cry of the sinner. And uh, his hand is not shortened. He can save. He hears the cry of the sinner. The problem for so many men of our day and so many people of our day is that, as it says here in verse 2, iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he won't hear for your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your, your lips speak lies, your tongue is muttered perverseness. None calls for justice. None pleads for truth. There's, they trust in lies. They trust in the lies of this world. They want a different Jesus, and they they won't face it. They don't want to face it. They don't cry. They don't call upon God because they're still. They don't see that they're bitten. They don't see their need. They don't see that their that the wrath of God lies upon them, as it says in Isaiah 12, that you had this wrath on me. And they want to hope, and if they ignore it, it'll all go away. It won't. It won't go away. The wrath of God is real. The hope in Christ is absolutely as real. And it's utterly beautiful. Um, may it be I need to learn to put a space thing here. May it be that uh, in the day that Christ visits you, you, you'll say the same thing. You were angry, angry with me, but your anger's turned away. Now you comfort me. And as it says in verse uh, 10 of chapter 11, and may it be that you find out that his rest is absolutely glorious.